video introduces you to issues related to statistical power and how that fits in with hypothesis testing. So statistical power has to do with the ability to reject the null hypothesis. It gives us some sense of how likely we are to be able to, to reject the null hypothesis if the null hypothesis is false, okay? Because it's making a correct decision, right? We want to be able to reject that null hypothesis when it's false. However, um, it, it's kind of a trade-off with our type 1 error rate. And I'll talk about that in a minute. But here, um, what we're saying is that it gives us a sense of what the probability is that we're actually going to reject the null when we should. And we would like that to be relatively high because the um, complement to statistical power is a type 2 error. So we want to minimize the number of times that we don't reject the null hypothesis when we ought to. So statistical power is the probability that we'll avoid a type 2 error. And you might remember from an earlier video that type 2 error is noted as the Greek letter beta. So power is noted as 1 minus beta. And so in order to determine statistical power, we need to get a set of information. Um, and you might find that this uh, is helpful in noting before uh, you watch the other video on statistical power uh, where I show you using some distributions of scores what that process looks like. The first step is that we need to gather all of the important information. We need the population mean and the population standard deviation. We're going to start by working with the population and then we need a sample mean the sample size, and then we use the standard error that we calculate using the population standard deviation and the sample size so that we can get a sense of how much these distributions overlap. Then we need to find our critical Z value and we find out what that critical value would be if it were um, a raw mean of our sampling distribution. And then we use that with respect to the second distribution of scores to find out what proportion of scores falls above that critical value. Um, or in the case that that second population is below um, the mean, it would be more extreme than that critical value. So here's what I'm uh, talking about. Um, we have, a, say, a study where we're talking about um, counseling center, what's uh, the likelihood that people will attend more sessions if they sign a contract to attend um, a certain amount of therapy sessions. So we need to find the mean for the first population, the overall population. And here we're saying that the mean number of visits is 4.6. The standard deviation of the population is 3.12 visits. We find the standard error um, using our planned sample size, which happens to be 9. So we find a standard error of 1.04. And then we have a mean of the second population. That's what we have in our sample. And if it were drawn from another population, what would that population mean be? So we're going to compare this value to this first sample mean. What's the likelihood that we could get a mean of 6.2 if we drew it from a population with a mean of 4.6? Is it likely or is it unlikely? So if we were to look at this whole um, situation, what we have is we have this first population mean of 4.6, here's mu, and we use this first population to say, okay, I'm going to do a one-tailed test, and we shade in the area 
that gives us 5% under the curve. And we know that this z-score that corresponds to this 5% will be um, a z-score of 1.96. So we have this z-score here of 1.96. Um, kind of hard to write with a mouse, so it's not very pretty. But that corresponds to a raw score. So if we took this 1.96 with respect to this population mean and found out what the raw score would be, we find out that it's 6.306. And so then we put this up here on the curve. We know that our sample mean, M, is this value, 6.2. So we're comparing these two. And that falls below this critical value here. And then our power will be this area under the second curve. So now let's just focus on the second curve right here that we have. Okay, so this is the curve for population two. And so now we could actually just really ignore the rest of this because we've already figured out what the value is here. And now we need to know what is the area that falls beyond here. This will give us power. And if you look this up in the Z table, so we take this 6.306, and this will now be our population mean, let's say. So, so what we do is we say 6. 0.306 minus 6.2. We divide it by the standard error, remember from our previous slide, which is 1.04. And then we get a z-score. And that z-score we use to find the area under the curve. And we know from looking it up in the back of the book that it's 46.02%. So that's our power. This is not very impressive for statistical power. Generally, we want statistical power to be somewhere around 0 0.80, which means that we're, we want to make the correct decision 80% of the time means that we're okay with committing a type 2 error 20% um, of the time. So you'll notice, too, that we have, um, I'm going to change my pen color here for a second. Okay. You'll notice, too, that we have this. 5% is alpha. So if we were to make some changes to our p-value, because remember, we set this alpha, then we could actually influence power. If we made alpha, say, 10%, so where's the cutoff for 10% of the distribution here? It would be over here somewhere. We added another 5%. And that means that the corresponding power would start getting over here, so we've just added more area here to power. So making our um, test a one-tailed test and even making our alpha value, which remember alpha is your type 1 error rate. Whew, writing with the mouse is not my forte. Type 1 error rate. Okay? We can change that. So that's the trade-off that we get. If you want a, a, a greater power and you want to lessen your type 2 error rate, you actually have to increase your type 1 error rate. So that's the relationship between those two. Okay. We'll come back over here to that and so here's just what I was talking about. If you increase alpha, you notice that these are overlap the same amount. Here's our statistical power. And if you make that into 10% instead of 5, you've just increased your power. There's more area under this curve. Another thing that we can do 
in order to increase our power is to use a one-tailed test instead of a two-tailed test. Now, this increases our statistical power, it's true, but remember, if we actually are mistaken and it turns out that our direction that we predicted is wrong, then we don't get to say anything about something that falls over in this region. Okay, so it only improves our statistical power if we are correct in the direction of the effect. We could also increase our sample size or decrease our standard deviation. Because remember, we're talking about distributions of means. And so by decreasing, increasing our sample size, we're decreasing the standard error because we have more people and it's a better approximation. So if we had less overlap, which is what happens when you decrease the standard deviation, then you actually have much greater power because these two distributions then have less overlap. And we can also increase the difference between means. Maybe there's some way that we can get that effect maximized for um, our independent variable. And you'll see that here, if we've spread these means further apart, then that means that there's more um, space between the two, and there's less overlap, again, of these distributions, and you, now you've increased your power. Here, it's under 50%. Here, it's probably something like, I don't know, 95%, because this almost looks like 5% over here. So, so you can really make a difference there by exaggerating that difference between the means. So here's a summary of those factors that are affecting power. If you increase your sample size, that increases statistical power. If you make your alpha level, your type 1 error rate, higher, then you'll also increase your statistical power. A one-tailed test has more statistical power than a two-tailed test. But remember, there's a trade-off there because then you're really putting all of your eggs in one basket, so to speak. And you can also decrease that standard deviation because it decreases the overlap between the distributions. And you could increase your difference between the means. And again, that also decreases, um, de or decreases the overlap between those distributions. So these are the, the main points that I want you to take home, especially thinking about how is it that you, as a, a researcher, might be able to um, improve your likelihood of rejecting the null hypothesis when you ought to reject the null hypothesis. And I'll say that usually this one, larger sample size, this is how we really assure that we have the statistical power that we want in our research study. Okay, so um, this is, I think, the, the probably a better video to watch before um, the one where I talk about how you actually work through that process. Um, and so this just gives you another example, but it also kind of gives you the big picture. So these are the things that I would really want you to take away, is how do we affect power? How can we change that?